go ahead and get started with prayer, shall we? Abba, Father, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we just want to bless you again for another Sabbath to be able to come together and to lift you up in the name of Yeshua, that your names may be glorified on this earth. May every knee come and bow before your throne and prostrate themselves in total homage and respect for you and your name, Yahweh, that it may be glorified. We pray for those that could not be here today, Abba, that you will be there with them and comfort them in their house or wherever they may be, and that you may strengthen their faith, Yahweh, and that if they are sick or have any other kind of infirmity, that you will heal them, Abba, by the blood of Yeshua. And we pray, Abba, that your spirit will come and be with us here and commune with us here today, Abba, that we may feel your presence and feel how your word is filling this earth, Abba, as your teachers around the world and as us as individuals who are the light of Yeshua are illuminating our light in this world, Abba, be an example to those outside that they may be drawn to your light through your people. So we just want to bless you and thank you, Yahweh, for your Torah, for your marriage contract, and for the blood of Yeshua that washes away all sin and uncleanliness and filthiness from us, Abba, is that you may look at us and see us as clean and pure in your sight, without defilement, in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, so last time we completed uh, Ge uh, Genesis uh, part four, I should say, and now we're going to go ahead and continue with Genesis, uh, continuing Genesis chapter one, verses 20 through 31. Then we're going to kind of just barely get into chapter two, verses one through three. And uh, so kind of the theme today, it isn't going to start off that way, but kind of the theme when we get done with this is going to be a Sabbath rest. At the end of the day, it's going to come down to a Sabbath rest. And for many of us, it's very difficult to define. For some of us, it's just, I don't have to go to work today. For some of us is, um, uh, my finances are taken care of, I got food on the table, I got a roof over my head, that's really great, I enjoy that. Uh, for some of us, it's I don't have the world bombarding me with its, uh, its, its demands and its burdens on me, and that's a great thing. But I think the Sabbath rest goes a lot beyond that. And I think for all of us, we need to really sit down and be able to ponder what does this Sabbath rest really mean. And for some of us, it's going to impact us a little bit more than others in certain areas. And for others, it will be in other areas because we are all facing different issues in our lives that where the Sabbath impacts us a little bit different. So today, I hope by the time we get done, it prods us into looking into just what is this Sabbath rest that Yahweh is conveying in Scripture. But before we get there, let's continue in verse 20. It says, Then Elohim said, let the waters abound as a mass of minute animals with an abundance as a swarming movement of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So Elohim created, and I found this to be interesting because in the Hebrew I found it says whales. But I don't have any translation that says whales in English. But this word uh, whales was in the Hebrew. And so it's uh, tanin, I guess is how you would say it, a marine monster or dragon and great sea creatures, nefesh, that breathe and every living thing that moves as to glide or crawl swiftly with which the waters abounded according to their kind uh, and species and every winged bird according to its kind and Elohim saw that it was good as beautiful. That's what he said. Verse 22, and Elohim blessed as an act of adoration to them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Verse 24, then Elohim said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind cattle, which is interesting in the Hebrew, it says a dumb muted beast that is quadruped. <laughs> I don't know why they're dumb. I guess I think I've heard where cows are noted to be kind of dumb animals. So um, I don't know that much about them, but I think I have heard that before. And creeping thing, a reptile or rapidly moving animal, and the beasts of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. Verse 25, And Elohim made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, 
and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. Verse 26. Then Elohim said, Let us make man, Adam, to show blood in the face as rosy. I never looked that up before, but that's what Adam means, to be show red in the face as rosy. In our image, a figure of resemblance, according to our likeness, that is similar. Let them have dominion over fish of the sea. It's interesting because a lot of people I've talked to over the years, they'll, they don't believe that man is made in the image according to the likeness of Yahweh. They think of him as some kind of like this, this vapor of smoke or something that hovers above the Ark of the Covenant and that he's, he doesn't actually have a physical form. It's amazing to me how many people I've talked to who actually believe that. We had a gentleman here, um, my wife's nephew, who I had a conversation with and he literally did not believe that Yahweh had an actual physical form. And I tried to tell him, I said, all you got to do is look at yourself, and that is a representation of him. And he didn't want to believe it. I said, well, I said, are you sitting down? He goes, yeah. I said, so you've got a rear end. He goes, yeah. I said, that's a tukus, you know. Absolutely. You're sitting down. I said, Yahweh has a tukus. He sits down, you know. So I tried to make it a little humorous, but the point was made. And then he sat back and he started thinking about it, and I think he kind of came around to it a little bit. Anyway, let's move on over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Here the lesser Yahweh, or the one who became Yeshua, is telling the greater Yahweh, the Father, let's make man. So this is the conversation that is going on between the two Elohims. Like Yahweh the Father, Adam, was alone at first, then Yahweh created Eve out of him. As we went through before, what we can see is this thing about the right side. And so here, it, symbolically, we have the Word who is at the right of the Father. And then we have man comes out of uh, the lesser Yahweh who is at the right of the lesser Yahweh. And then we have the woman who comes out of the man who is at the right of man. And so we see this protocol that's being illustrated in Scripture. And that's what I'm trying to bring out here. Like the Father, His Son, Yeshua, came out of Him. We, the bride, uh, come from His side. Adam possessed both genders within Himself. This, in part, is making of Him in His image and His likeness. I don't want to get too heavy into this, but I find that it's interesting that here we seem to find... Uh, an example where when Adam was created, Eve was down inside his loins. And so the original man had the nature of the female residing within him. Right. And yet today we have men who do not understand a woman. And I find that to be a very interesting enigma, how man doesn't understand woman. And so I think a lot of times what it comes down to is men don't understand women because it's not imparted to them automatically. But it does reside down inside of you if you choose to want to understand a woman. Even Shaul says, husbands dwell with your wives with understanding. In other words, take the time to study your wife. If you study your wife, you will get to understand her. And it, once you start to understand her, you will be a cod. You will start to become at one. I often t joke sometimes, I could be upstairs on the computer doing work, and all of a sudden I'll get this sensation for a craving for a milkshake at, um, what you call it, Chick-fil-A. They make really good milkshake. And when I get that sensation, I'll come downstairs and I'll say to my wife, I'll say, you want a milkshake, don't you? She goes, yeah. <laughs> I said, let's get in the car and we go. So we go over there and I get her strawberry, I get my chocolate or vanilla or whatever. But the point is, is that I can, I, many times I can feel what my wife is feeling even though I'm not in the room. And, and, and that's what we're supposed to be doing as husbands and wives, particularly as husbands, as I'm speaking in that role, is you should be able to be so connected to your wife that you can feel what she's feeling. You can think what she's thinking. And so Adam possessed all this within himself. And I believe that when Yahweh took Eve out of him from his side, he still had that connection. And it's only after the fall, when they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when the carnal nature came in and corrupted and severed 
that understanding. And I think that's when man lost their ability to understand inherently within themselves how a woman actually thinks and feels. And I think vice versa, I think that's when a woman lost her ability to understand how a man functions. Because I believe that she, inside of him, also understood inherently how a man is supposed to be. And I think when he created them, he created them perfect. He didn't create this chaos and confusion. This is something that belongs to the carnal nature of man, which comes from the seed of Hasatan. Anyway, enough on that. Let's go on and continue on Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 27. It says, So Elohim created man in his own image. In the image of Elohim, he created him, male, as a mark to be recognized. That's what that means in the Hebrew. And female from the sexual form. I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Why did he choose that word that way? That's really interesting. I haven't really had time to think about it that much. But from the sexual form. So apparently the form of a woman is what marks her for being a woman. He created them. Now, uh, Eve was not yet created in a physical form yet. It was a kind of prophetic statement. In other words, Yahweh speaking into Adam when he's creating him. These are the components that I'm creating inside of you. And out of you will come this stuff. Just like inside Yahweh the Father was the Word. And he spoke through his word that his word today, you will be my son and I will be to you a father forever. So he spoke into his word what this word would become. So in the same way, this word now possessed the will of the father to speak into Adam what Adam is going to be and what was going to come out of that. Man has that same capacity. We have the ability to prophesy hopefully correctly, based on Yahweh's will, we have that same capacity if we have the word in us and the belief and the faith in us to speak into the world what we expect to come to pass. But so many of the times we are not speaking into the world what we want to come to pass, what should come to pass. We're speaking against our circumstances. And we're actually confirming that which we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears, which is detrimental to us. We're confirming that it exists and we're putting our faith and, tr faith and trust in that. Instead of speaking against the mountain and saying, move from here to there, I don't want you around anymore. So we wind up being victims of our circumstances and we stay entrapped in our circumstances because we don't learn to use our mouth correctly and speak the proper things into our life that we need to. I'm guilty of it. I'm still guilty of it. But I try to be as conscious as I possibly can not to do that and feel when I'm walking in the flesh in that moment and try to bring it into subjection. That's our goal. That's what we're supposed to be doing. The lesser Yahweh, Yeshua, came first. Then we, the woman, or the bride, is being prepared for him to be at his right hand. So here we see that same protocol is being established. Okay, so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For Adam was formed, fabricated into a mold, in the Greek, first, in the order of importance. Woman, note that. Men were created first in the order of importance. I don't want to rub salt in the womb. Well, naturally, we need to keep that in proper context. Then, in succession of time, and that's what we're dealing with in Genesis 1, uh, chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, Eve. Eve came after, in other words. So we got confirmation from Scripture there about that. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, and let's continue and pick up in verse 28. Uh, 28. I don't know why I got 29 there. It should be 28. Then Elohim blessed them as a self-existing entity. And I guess what that means is, at first when Yahweh created Adam from the dust of the ground, it was just a form standing there. Then Yahweh breathed his Ruach into that nefesh, and it became a living soul, which is now I'm expecting that this self-existing entity now has its own life. Uh, naturally from Yahweh. And Elohim said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we're already seeing one of the first things that Yahweh is saying is, I'm giving you the spirit of dominion and power over these different things. And so we too, in the body of Messiah, we have an authority. And I just really think we have not tapped into this yet. 
I really don't think that we really understand just what kind of authority we really have. And I think that's one of the, the greatest weapons that Hasatan perpetuates is on us. And that is if I can get you guys to believe that you're not what Yeshua is saying that you are, which comes back to the identity thing I was speaking about all last year, then you will never reach your potential. You will never reach your calling to the degree that Yahweh wants you to reach. And so you'll limit yourself. You'll have these limiting beliefs that will consistently break you down, consistently sabotage your circumstances so that you never see the kind of victory that you're supposed to have. And yet, this is what we're to aspire to. And so I believe Yahweh was giving Adam and Eve the basic authority to see how they'll handle that basic authority. And then later, when the plan of salvation kicks in, then you go into the realm where you start actually exercising authority over the unclean spirits that resided on the earth at that time. Yahweh, the, uh, Yeshua, the lesser, is speaking into man what he will do. He will bring many sons into the world in similar manner. Yeshua does the same spiritually by causing us to be fruitful. So let's move on. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 through 14, we see, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing by leading, and that's what his spirit does, his spirit leads us, many sons to glory to make captain, and I found it to be interesting, the word captain means chief leader and a prince of our salvation, perfect, for both he who sanctifies, which is ceremonially holy, and those who are being sanctified are all of one, of which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And in verse 12, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. This is a uh, quote from what King David was saying uh, back in the Old Testament. And so here it's interesting that Yeshua did this in his prayer to the Father in John chapter 17. He says, Father, these men that you have given me out of the world, I have declared your name to them. And so people like to fight about the name of Yahweh. Oh, you don't need to say the name of Yahweh or this and that and the other. But Yeshua says, I have declared your name that you have given me to these men who you've called out of the world. Well, if in those days they knew the name of the Father, how can you declare something to somebody if they already knew what it was? So the implication is, is that they did not know what the name of the Father was. He, Yeshua himself said, I came to reveal the Father. Well, to reveal the Father means to reveal not only the name, but the very essence of who he is, from which Yeshua came. So we see that that quote as being spoken here in Hebrews, is what Yeshua actually fulfilled in John chapter 17. Let's move on, verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, here I am, the children whom Yahweh has given me. Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power, which is great vigor, over of death, that is the devil. So the devil has great vigor, great power, and great authority over death. And so Yeshua has given us the power and the authority to have power over the death of what he's trying to impute to us. We have power of life if we will choose it. As Torah says, today I set before you life and death. And so we have to choose. So when we decide that we're going to break the commandments and the Torah contract, and we're going to do our own ways and have our own thoughts, we are choosing death. We are willfully giving ourselves over to Hasatan saying, take me, I'm yours. Instead of saying, no, I'm going this way. I'm going the straight and the narrow path. I'm not going to rely on my own understanding. I'm not going to rely on my own nature. I'm not going to rely on my own way of reasoning things and just do it the way I want to do it because that's the way it seems right. That's when we're in trouble. We should not lean on our own understanding. So in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 29, we continue. It says, And Elohim said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose uh, fruit yields seed. To you it shall be food. And also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. 
Verse 31, Then Elohim saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So in Genesis chapter 2 now we're going into, verses 1 through 3, we'll start off with verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts, which is in the word host means a mass of beings for an appointed time. I thought that was kind of interesting. A mass of beings for an appointed time of them were finished. You know, when we go back to the Hebraic Maseroth, what we're looking at is the celestial bodies as a time clock for appointed times and seasons, for years and days and so forth. And those all represent the plan of salvation for man. And these hosts in heaven are waiting for when this celestial time clock clicks and the, the midnight bell goes off and the seventh trumpet is blown and then Yeshua comes down and he lifts up us up and we ascend with him and come back to fight against the enemies of Israel. This is that moment that the whole celestial sky is, is beaming to the earth as we were talking about the last time. Whether you hear it or not, it's still beaming this message out of them and we're, uh, we're finished. Verse 2, And on the seventh day Elohim ended his work which is a ministry of workmanship which he had done and rested to desist from exerting oneself on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Verse 3, Then Elohim blessed as an act of adoration the seventh day and sanctified it and pronounced it as ceremonially clean. And it's interesting because today people, particularly Christians, like to say, well, any day is holy or any day is sanctified. But you can't find any case precedents in Scripture for that. And he's saying that this day is the only day that's ceremonially clean. And that's how we have to keep this ceremonially clean. Because in it, he rested from his work, which he, Yahweh, had created and had made. So let's move on here. Victory or defeat lies in the Sabbath being sanctified. Or not. Victory or defeat lies in the Sabbath being sanctified or not. That's our choice. In my 34 years in walking in this thing, I have seen consistent patterns over and over again. And the consistent patterns I have seen, and I speak for myself from my own experience of what I've been through as well as what I see other people going through, and that is there's a common denominator. The common denominator is this. The Sabbath is a sign that marks Yahweh's people. Right? We can all pretty much agree on that. If the Sabbath is a sign that marks Yahweh's people, and Yahweh rested on the Sabbath, and he said to keep it holy and keep it sanctified and keep it set apart, when the world looks at us, what are they looking at when regards to the Sabbath? They'll see us as this people. But if they see what we do or don't do on the Sabbath, what does that mean to them? for ones that have at least an understanding. I think that's something we need to take a look at because that is a message that we are sending whether consciously or subconsciously, whether we understand it or not, this is a message that we are sending to people. So let's take a look here. In Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 20 through 27 it states, Neither carry forth a burden to desire out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Neither do you any work but hollow, and a pronounce it as ceremonially clean. Ye uh, you the Sabbath day, as I commanded your fathers. So here Yahweh is saying that he wants us to make a distinction. When this day comes, we're not to carry any burdens in. I have seen over the years where people go through the week and they're working or whatever it is they're doing, and they're so embroiled in this world, whether it's with work or relationships out in this world, and they're so caught up and they got so much drama going on that when the Sabbath comes, they drag that stuff right in with them, right through the gates of their house, into their house, and their whole Sabbath is turned upside down. And they have no peace, and they have no shalom, and they can't rest, and their spirit is edgy, and they're constantly on edge, and they're constantly agitated, and they're not happy, and they got no peace. And so what I learned for me years ago is that when the Sabbath comes, Leave me alone. I, I speak out of my mouth. I, I say, leave me alone. I had two people who I've told them over and over again. When Friday afternoon comes, don't call me. It's not that I don't love you. I don't like you. Don't call me. I'm busy. I'm getting prepared for the Sabbath. 
and I don't have time to talk to you. Call me after the set. What do they do yesterday? They send me emails, send me texts, they send me leaving messages on my phone. I said, these guys don't get it, you know? But I, I, I put a blockade. I can understand why in Judaism they have a, a concept where they build fences. They build one fence around whatever they're trying to protect, then they build a second fence around that, then they build a third fence around that. If you can get through those three fences, then I'm yours. But it's not likely you're going to get through those three fences. So you build this hedge of protection around yourself. But if you leave yourself vulnerable, where these fences all have open gates, and people can just kind of come in and out of your life during the Sabbath and turn your Sabbath upside down and cause all kinds of drama in your life, it's your own fault. Because you're the one who's choosing not to lock those gates. And so that becomes because you're not keeping it sanctified, not keeping it holy. You know, I've said it before, when a husband and a wife, because this is a husband and wife relationship kind of scenario that we're talking about here, when a husband and a wife have intimate time together, they don't invite other people in. Do you? Nobody in their right mind does that. Unless you're into some kind of perversion or something. But, I mean, normally, that's not something you do. That's your time together. That's intimacy together. The rest of the world is blotted out. You're reconfirming your marriage contract with each other. Nobody else belongs there. Well, the Sabbath is the same way. It's, it's, it's a kind of intercourse in a certain kind of way, metaphorically speaking, even though we're not married yet, but we're betrothed, this is the time where the Messiah is courting us and we're responding and we're learning of his ways and he's telling us, this is how I feel. I don't like it when you do this. I don't like it when you do that. Please don't do this. Please don't do that. I want to marry you, but I can't marry you yet because you're not ready. You're stubborn. You're stiff-necked. You're hardened. You won't listen to what I'm telling you. You want to do your own ways. You want to have your own thoughts. You want to do whatever it is you want to do. And I can't can't marry a woman like that right now. I can't have a woman that's going to tell me how it's going to be. I'm the man. I was created first. You came out of me. I'm trying to redeem you from the curse of this world and you just want to drag me into it. And that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. There's a protocol here. There's an order here. If you're tired of this world and you're tired of all the trials and tribulations and not being able to dig yourself out of the mess you've created in your life, I can get you out. But you're going to have to look to me because I'm not looking to you. Got to have a change of heart. And it's like I told them last week. I said, the purpose of the new contract, the brick kadashah, is not that the first one is done away with. It goes back to Jeremiah chapter 31. He says, I will sprinkle you with new water. And I will take out the stony heart out of, your, of your, yourself. And I will give you a heart of flesh so that you can, feel my, you can feel me as written in my word. So you'll understand my heart so that the two of us can be thinking the same way. That's what it's about. Verse 23. But they obeyed to hear with intelligence and obey not, neither inclined by morally deflecting their ear. How many of us have relationships or even in marriage where one person is trying to, your wife or your husband is trying to tell you something and you go, yeah, where have I heard that before? And you don't, you don't want to hear it. You don't want to recognize what they're trying to tell you. This is what he's conveying here. He's speaking to them. He's speaking to them and they're inclining their ear away. They don't want to hear it because they have a heart of stone. They don't want the instruction. It doesn't benefit me to hear your instruction. I enjoy what I'm doing. I'm miserable, but I enjoy my misery. You know, it's interesting because there are rare cases where human beings actually enjoy pain and suffering more than they do pleasure. It's kind of a perverted way the mind works, but there are some people that actually enjoy being inflicted with pain. It validates who they are. 
And so here, they don't want to hear Yahweh's instruction because that's going to encroach on their life and it's going to get in their way and it's going to disrupt their life and they're not going to be able to do the things that they want to do. That's technically walking in the flesh. That's what walking in the flesh is. The flesh is saying, I want to do this. This is my way. I enjoy this and I'm not ready to give it up. I don't want your Sabbath rest. I don't want to enter into that. I have what I have and that's it. Don't infringe on my space. And so we all have these little battles about this infringement in our lives. I include myself. And I'm constantly fighting with myself to bring these areas under control. Don't always go, do it perfectly, but I try, I'm trying to understand it more and more. And so this is what's going on here. They're turning their ear away. They don't want to be infringed on. They're not ready for it yet. They haven't gotten their tukuses whooped enough yet to the point where they cry uncle. And it's not until we uh, in the body of Messiah, I think is why Yeshua has not come back yet, because we have not gotten to the point yet where we said we've had enough. The Israelites did in the mud pits. They couldn't take it anymore. They were screaming out for a deliverer. They finally got to the end of their rope. Yahweh knows how to get us to the end of our rope. And he'll prolong us and chill us out until we finally get to the point where we say we had enough. And then we'll call on him. And then we'll incline our ear towards, not away from. And so we have to incline our ear towards him. The ear but made their neck stiff and dense so that it is toughened. You ever see somebody, I think they call them a military neck or something. You ever see somebody who walks like this? You know, their neck is so hunched over and it's from burdens. It's a burdensome life and they've gotten into that posture and they can't stand erect. Their neck is not flexible anymore. The burdens of this life has, has just pulled them and hunched them over into a subservient uh, posture to whatever it is that they're suffering from. They may, that they may not hear nor receive instruction. Verse 24, And it shall come to pass, if you diligently hearken, and it's interesting because here's the word Shema. This is what we just did when we prayed for Israel. That's the Shema. So that's what the word hearken means. To hear with intelligence and to obey. So it's one thing to hear with intel and comprehend with intelligence and understand. It's another thing to take that and then say, okay, I'm going to go do it. That's a, different, that's a different level altogether. Unto me saith Yahweh to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but shall, but hollow, which is Kadesh, and pronounce it as ceremonially clean. So we're back to pronouncing that it's ceremonially clean, and I'm not going to defile the Sabbath day to do no work therein. Verse 25, then shall uh, there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. So notice the difference. The difference here is that because they choose to incline their ear and listen with intelligence and, and obey, he sends them a blessing. People will be able to go in and out of the city. You won't have to worry about the enemies turning your life upside down, that you've got so much turmoil in your life, and there seems to be no end to the turmoil. There's no end to the financial problems. There's no end to the physical infirmities that we're going through. There's no end to the relationship issues and all the other things that this life likes to throw at us. Instead, what you find here is if you just obey, I will basically cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth. I will pour the blessings on you. I can go through so many other scriptures that talk about all this stuff, but we don't have the time to go through them all. Verse 26, And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin, which is interestingly called the son of the right hand. Here we're back to this right hand again. So Benjamin means son of the right hand. And from uh, the plain, which is the maritime slope, I got the typo there. Sorry about that. The maritime slope of the land. So this is the area, I guess, close to the ocean is what it's talking about. And from the mountains and from the south, which is the parched desert area, which is the Negev, which is our brother Joshua uh, camped out down in there in the Negev area. So that's what that's talking about. Bringing burnt offerings 
as an ascending staircase. So it's interesting that word in the Hebrew, Allah, is like an ascending staircase. So the smoke is like ascending in stages and going up like in waves, or I guess is what it's trying to get across. And sacrifices and meat offerings, which is minka, that are bloodless as a tribute. So I guess what that really means is that after a sacrifice has occurred where they blood has been let out of the animal and they've cut the animal up into pieces and the animal's been dried out of the blood, those pieces that you have, you come and you give that as kind of like a free will offering. That's what it's talking about. And incense, which is frankincense, and bringing sacrifices of praise, which is a choir of worshipers. That's what that means in the Hebrew, todah unto the house of Yahweh. Consequences of being stiff-necked and hardened. There are consequences. And we all need to look at the consequences of this. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 says, Circumcise, or cut short therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked and dense, so that it is toughened. Uh, last year I had done a study um, on, or teaching on, I think it was in Galatians where I was talking about circumcision and I had brought out how even our heart, technically speaking, has what's called a pericardium. A pericardium is actually a foreskin that covers the heart. And it can become calcified, which is extremely dangerous because then what happens is some of the, um, the bodily fluids that surround the heart in that pericardium can leak out and get into your lungs and cause you all kinds of problems. So here, what he's telling us here is that you have to cut the foreskin of your heart. It needs to be circumcised because when you do that, you will avoid the stiff neck mentality. You will. It, you know, it, it's just amazing to me how much this flesh wants to fight against this. And it just loves staying in this state of stiff neckness, being stiff necked in a hardened heart all the time. And, we, and yet, it's, I think what Yahweh's trying to say to us is, Life can go so much easier for you if you'll just listen to what I'm telling you. You're killing yourself. You're destroying yourself. And you just won't hear me that if you just come to the other side of the fence, to my side of the fence, I'll show you how much easier it could really be. But unfortunately, we do come out of a world where we don't have a reference for that. You know, have you ever done something in your life where you struggled and you fought and you struggled and you fought and you're just trying to beat this thing down and you're trying to get it to be done and just want like, okay, for example, like you have a part in your car that you just can't break the bolt loose. You know, you, 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 you got a crowbar on the end of your ratchet and you're trying to break this bolt loose and you just can't get in there and you can't get it done. And you're fighting for hours and hours and hours and the wife is belching at you and saying, you dummy, won't you just take that to the mechanic? He's got a special tool that he put in there and he breaks it loose in three seconds. And then finally, after being so aggravated and so ticked off and your knuckles are all busted up and you got you know, blood coming out all over, you say, okay, that's it, I had enough. And you listen to the wife and you go to the mechanic and he puts the thing like that and it's out. You could have had it so much easier if you just would have done it that way. But it's our pride to prove that I'm a man. I can break this nut loose, you know? And yet you can't, you humiliate yourself. And so, you know, when you get a taste of how easy it is with the mechanic who has that tool that can break that bolt loose, you have a reference for that once you experience it. But we're coming from a perspective where we're coming out of this world and we don't have that easy way. We don't really understand. Our minds have no reference for it. But Yahweh is speaking to us constantly, trying to plead with us, trying to get us to understand. Just come to the mechanic. I've got just the right tool that can break that nut loose, just like that. But because of our lack of faith, we don't want to do it. Or because we're stiff-necked and we're hardened and we just can't bear to give up what we perceive in ourselves that we're going to have to give up. For me, coming into the faith originally, I didn't want to give up my fishing. I enjoyed going out on Saturdays in the boat with my friend and go fishing or go diving, whatever it is, depending on the weather. That's what I liked. And when Yahweh called me to the Sabbath, I put him off for a year because I felt like by doing that, I would miss a day of being out on the boat. <laughs> it's stupid, but, but in that time frame and the way that I was thinking, it made perfect sense. 
And that's how we are, aren't we? Uh, let's move on. Okay. Hardening of our heart prolongs our trials. This is another problem when we don't allow the Sabbath rest to come into our lives in the trueness of it. It prolongs us. Again, this is coming back to the fact that if the Sabbath is a mark that marks us as his people, and if we have a covenant with Yahweh, and that Sabbath is a mark, and we don't hollow that Sabbath, and we don't keep it pure and sanctified as best as we understand it, okay, then what happens is that is probably one of the greatest tools that I've seen over the years that Hasatan uses to gain entrance into a person's life and turn their life upside down and hold them in bondage. And by being held in that bondage, the problem with that is, is that when you're held in bondage and you can't break loose because of your own, you can't. You belong to him in that set of circumstances. What happens is you start to become bitter and angry and frustrated and that stiffens your neck and it hardens your heart. Because then you ha what happens is I've heard a lot of people start saying, Yahweh doesn't hear my prayers. Oh, he hears your prayers. Sure he hears your prayers. But he's not going to answer them. Because he's already told you in his word, stop doing this stuff. You're destroying yourself. Stop doing that. It has unintended consequences that you're not sure what's happening in your life because you haven't connected the dots. And when you connect the dots and you understand how those dots are interconnected, oh, wow, I wish I would have known this a few years ago. I could have stopped the bleeding way back then. This is just the life as it is in Yeshua. It's a growing process. It's a learning process. It's a process of discovering. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. I do this, that happens. I don't do this, this is what happens. That's what this is all about. In Psalm chapter 95, verse 8 through 11, it says, Harden and dense so that it is tough and not your heart, as in the day of provocation in Meribah. There's that word Meribah. I think we talked about this a few weeks ago, which means strife. And this goes back to Numbers chapter 27, 14, where Israel was rebelling and Moses had to deal with all this stuff. As in the day, well, that's the same word. As in the day of temptation... Testing that is judicial from Yahweh. You see, the point is, what we go through is called judicial testing. Why is it judicial? Because we have a covenant of law. And that law is moral in nature. People like to say it's ceremonial, it's for priests, hogwash. It's moral. When we choose to do something on the Sabbath that we shouldn't be doing, we are breaking moral law. We are breaking moral law. Because Yahweh establishes it as moral law. And so therefore, what happens is, it becomes a judicial testing. It's like you're being dragged into the, uh, the, the, law, the court of Yahweh. And he's saying, okay, you're doing this. This has to have consequences because my word says it will have consequences. And if my word says it's going to have consequences, it's going to have consequences unless I decide to have mercy and move my hand over it and, and, and postpone the consequences for a while to see if I can get to your heart and convince you to stop before you destroy yourself. Or before the circumstances get so bad, then you're really going to be in trouble. And I don't want you going that far, okay? But then there comes a point where in the hardness of the heart and the stiff neck doesn't want to hear after repetition of messages coming to us telling us to stop then he lets his hand come away and the consequences comes over us and then all hell breaks loose at that point and you wish you were dead because now you don't see any way out the dark clouds have come over your life and you're surrounded by all this darkness and gloom and despair and the shalom peace has left us because we don't have that Sabbath rest inside of us and we're in trouble and unless you get on your knees and you cry out to Yahweh to show you what needs to be done, you're in big trouble. We're all in big trouble if we don't do that. As in the day of temptation, testing that is judicial from Yahweh. Because the bottom line is we are being tested in a court of law. Because we are claiming that we have a law covenant, which is the Torah. 
And so if we claim that we have this covenant, but we willfully or ignorantly or whichever way or through weakness go and violate that, and we do it consistently, he's going to drag us into the court, so to speak. And we're going to appear before the righteous judge, and the righteous judge is going to decide what he's going to do with us in that situation. Like I said, uh, I was talking with Kamar earlier, when we think back when we were younger about all the stupid things we did, he moved his hand off to the side. He was giving you a lot of mercy. He could have chose not to, but he gave you, cut you a lot of slack. He cut me a lot of slack too, you know? And so looking back, I have that reference. You have that reference. Look back and say, he should have wiped me out a long time ago through normal means. But he was preserving you for something later to show you. Thankfully, you got the message. You changed your ways. And so the consequences, at least to the fullness of it, didn't have to come on your life. Because he chastens a son whom he loves. And if we listen and we hear and we do the Shema and we hear and then we obey, then the consequences go away. They have no legal authority. I think it's in the Psalms that says, A curse without a cause shall not alight. So in other words, somebody can accuse you of something, but if you're not guilty of it, the curse of that that proclamation has no authority on your life because it, it, didn't, it never happened. So it can't alight. It can't manifest itself in any kind of way that can have any hold or authority over your life. In the wilderness where cattle are driven. Verse 9, when your fathers tempted me, proved me by investigating. This is what we do. This is interesting that he uses this word, by investigating. You see, we humans, by nature, we like to investigate what we can get away with. So if I come to Pedro, and I think I can play, be a player with Pedro, and I can kind of manipulate him a little bit, and I get away with it, then I'm like, I'm kind of investigating. I'm testing investigating Pedro. Just how much can I push Pedro to get away with? So he let me get away with it this time. Okay, well I can see that he didn't draw a line there, so now I'm going to take a little bit of liberty and I'm going to push him to the next level. And I'm going to investigate that. And this is what we do, don't we as human beings? We're always playing with that edge. We're always trying to see just how far we can push on the Sabbath to see what we can get away with just shy of getting the hammer coming down on top of us. Problem is, these things tend to have a cumulative effect over a period of time. And then by the time the, the, the consequences come, you've already stored up for yourself a whole bunch of nonsense, and now the calamity comes on you, and you've deceived yourself. Because like with all things in this life, when you think that you can keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and you get away, you get away, you get away, then all of a sudden when it comes time to pay the piper, you don't want to pay the piper, but now you got to pay. And these are just these are the hard things about this walk, is that we cannot take it lightly. There are consequences for these things. And you saw my work. Verse 10, 40 years long I was grieved and was detested to the point of cutting off with this generation and said, it is a people that do err, by reeling and straying in their heart, and they have not. So they're reeling and straying in their heart. So it starts in the heart. It's, that's where your seat of emotions and your passions and your desires and your lust and all that things are. You know, it's said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you can understand what is going on inside the heart of a person if you listen. Solomon says, be quick to hear and slow to speak. But if you listen to what people say, you can see a repeating pattern. And that repeating pattern tends to tell you what is residing down inside that heart. Good or bad, you know, that's not the point one way or the other. It's just a principle. Known by observation and instruction my ways. That is a course of life as a mode of action. So Yahweh's Torah, or in this case specifically, his Sabbath, is a way that is a course for this life. Because when you have this Sabbath rest, you've got everything that you need. It's like I was talking with Kamar earlier about, you know, this problem, that problem, all these things, you know, that are trying to crowd my life. Don't mean anything. At the end of the day, it's my Sabbath rest. Because that's what gets me my into eternal life. It's a portal. It's a doorway. When Yeshua rose on the Sabbath, 
at the end of the Sabbath, it was still the Sabbath, when he rose, that Sabbath is a shadow picture of a portal, a doorway from this world into the spirit realm. He left this physical world and went through that door into the spirit realm for eternity. Not subject to this world anymore. When we enter in every Sabbath, what we are proclaiming to Yahweh is, I want a taste of what Yeshua went through. He went through that Sabbath. And that's why we read in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 that Yahweh said, I swore in my wrath that they will not enter into my rest because of the hardness of their heart and their rebellion. And then he goes on to say in uh, chapter 4 verse 9, he says, Therefore there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of Yahweh. It's still here despite what others would like to tell us. Psalm 95, verse 8 through 11, uh, 11 now. So, unto whom I swore as a declaration spoken to myself seven times. It's interesting, this word Shabbat means not to just swear, but swear in the sense that you're repeating that phrase seven times. Seven is the number of completion. That's why the Sabbath is on the seventh day. It completes you. It gives you everything that you need to have in that day. You're not going to get it on Sunday. You're not going to get it on Monday. And you're not going to get it on a Wednesday Bible study as tradition tends to have it. You're going to get it on the Sabbath. That's the day that the Messiah specifically is speaking most intimately to his people. That's why it's marked as that day. And we should not allow anything else to get in that way as we would not with our spouse in those intimate times. In my wrath, as I breathe rapidly through my nostrils, that they should not enter into my rest, which is a peaceable matrimony. That's interesting in the Hebrew. It's menuka, menu means a peaceable matrimony. See, it comes back to this marriage again. We are marrying the Messiah. And so that rest is only within the marriage. That's the only place where you're sanctified, is in that marriage. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 14 states, Happy is a man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall. Will fall. He didn't say might. He didn't say maybe. He will fall. See, this is the illusion that we create for ourselves. We think we get away with this, we get away with that, we get away with the other, and nothing has happened to me, so surely it must be okay. That's an illusion. You are tricking yourself. You're thinking within your own mind that you can do these things and you're going to get away with it. It doesn't matter what it is in Yahweh's law, Sabbath or otherwise. We should not be allowing our carnal mind to dictate to us that we think we can do certain things and we're going to get away with it. And when we do get away with it, it's solidified within ourselves. See, I got away with it. So it must be okay. But it's not okay. It's not okay, because somewhere, if you have the Ruach in you, somewhere in there, that Ruach is saying to you, this ain't right. You know it ain't right. But because it serves your best interest, you want to do it anyway. And that should be your contrast. That should be telling you that you've got two natures inside of you in that moment are fighting against one another. And we need to listen to Shema. We need to hear, and then we need to obey. We need to hear the rock speaking to us saying, that ain't right. You should be able to feel something in your loins that, set, that is unsettling about it. And that, that, when we start learning how to walk in the spirit by contrast of walking in the flesh, it becomes much easier to discern these things. All too many people don't understand the difference. Um, okay, by casting down yourself into calamity and evil distress. And that's what that word calamity means. That's ra. It's an, an evil distress. The Sabbath is about restoration. Even the land gets its rest when it has been defiled. So who would say, well, why does the land need rest? Well, that goes into a much bigger uh, discussion, and that's not the point here. But even Yahweh... When he gets sick and tired of his people transgressing his laws, he even sends them out of the land and he gives the land rest. In Leviticus chapter 26, verse 33 through 35, it states, I will scatter or diffuse you as a winnowing fan. Funny, last week when I was meeting with these people and we're outside looking at the celestial bodies, I showed them where the winnowing fan is. 
And they were amazed by that. They had no idea what that was. You among the nations and draw out a sword after the hind part, the tukas. They're coming after your rear end. That's what that means, basically, in the here in, in the in the in the Hebrew. Um, your land shall be desolate and your cities waste from drought. So the waste here is not the same waste that we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, that it's a it's a wasteland. This is mainly through drought. And it's misuse of land. And it's misuse of land because they're misusing the Torah. They're violating the Sabbath. They're not rotating their crops. They're not letting the land rest on the seventh year uh, from growing seasons. And so, therefore, it brings a drought, which is um, a waste in the, in the land. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, we see about the winnowing fan. This winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean, which is to cleanse perfectly. That's what it means. Out of his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable, that is, a perpetual fire. And so here's what the winnowing fan looks like in the constellations. It's up there as a reminder that this earth is the threshing floor. And when Yahweh is ready to send his son back to the earth, he's going to take that winnowing fan and he's going to start blowing it back and forth and he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the, and the chaff is going to dissipate into the air and, and fly away. He's going to discard that which is not usable. Back to verse uh, 34 in Leviticus 26. Then the land shall enjoy to be pleased as a satisfying debt. That's what the word means in the Hebrew. To be pleased in the sense of a satisfying debt. I had one time where I, um, they wanted to repossess my house. And I was out of work for a couple years after 9-11. It was a really bad time. And they were, I think, a matter of weeks away from repossessing the house. And somebody came and they wrote me a check for $10,800 and said, pay it. And it got paid. It was, it was a gift. It wasn't even a loan. They said, pay it. And they, they took me out. Now, you talk about being pleased. You know what it is to think as a man that you can't find work, you don't have any money, you're, they're going to take your house away, your wife and your two kids are going to be out on the street, and somebody comes along and they write you a check for $10,800 and says, pay this bill. And they redeemed us out of it. Funny, because many years later, that person found themselves in trouble, and we reciprocated and helped them. This is how the body is. When one part of the body hurts, the other body is supposed to come and help that part of the body. You know, this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, is Sabbath as long as it lies desolate and grows numb? So the word here actually means to grow numb. The, the land grows numb. And you are in your enemy's land, then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. The land's going to enjoy it because you're not treading on it and defiling it, contrary to Yahweh's instructions. This is why it got that way in the first place. So even Yahweh enjoys having you not in the land. <laughs> you know? Yahweh enjoys us not being in the land because all we're going to do is defile it. Because we're not obedient. Verse 35, as long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbath, when you dwelt, Yashab, when sat married as a judge in it. We talked about this word before earlier in these studies, how that when you're in the land, you're sitting actually as a judge. You see, we're here on this earth to learn from Yeshua and have the kind of going back to the dominion and authority that I was talking about earlier is because we're here to sit as judges. We're to be judicial. We're to take Yahweh's law, understand it, implement it, so that we understand how it actually works in the real world and not negate it. And then when we understand it, we have authority to judge. Shaul talked about, I think it was Shaul, talked about, is there not any of you in this congregation that knows how to judge amongst one another? Instead, you go to the world's courts? You know, are we not mature enough yet that we can understand how to administrate judicially the Torah? Uh, sadly, no, I don't think we do. And I include myself. In conclusion, let's look at Isaiah chapter 56, verse 4 through 8. For thus says Yahweh to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me. See, keeping his Sabbaths is what pleases him. And hold fast my covenant. 
So keeping the Sabbath is directly tied to keeping the covenant. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of the sons and, and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. That's Yeshua. Verse 6. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh. Today we're told not to love the name of Yahweh. But he's telling us this is prophetic. This is for the end times uh, as well as back then. To love his name and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even to them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And I think this pictures what Zechariah chapter 12 is talking about. When the millennium comes and Yeshua is sitting on his throne. And all the nations will have to come up to worship uh, Yeshua in Jerusalem. Verse 8. Yahweh Elohim who gathers the outcasts of Israel says. Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. So, with that being said, I hope that we can see a little bit more now why Yahweh sanctifies in Genesis chapter 2, why he sanctified the seventh day. In part, there's a lot more to it than just that, but we don't have the time to go through all of the different reasons why the Sabbath is a set-apart day and why it's so important to Yahweh to the point that even he rested. Because many of us would think, why does Yahweh need to rest? He's an eternal spirit being. He has limitless energy. He is the consummation of energy itself. So why would he need to rest? But, but he's, what he's doing is he's sending us symbolically a gesture. And that if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. And if it's good enough for us, it's got to be good enough for the rest of the world. So we need to be a committee to one to make sure that within ourselves, we have that Sabbath rest. So that like Yeshua, we can enter into his rest and not have our carcasses drop dead in the wilderness or at least dragging around in the wilderness in that heat where we don't have the redemption. And we need that shalom peace. So let's enter into that rest so that Yahweh can look at us and say, these are my people and I am their Elohim and they love my name and they love my covenant and they'll not depart from it and they'll follow Messiah wherever he goes, right? Amen. Shalom. Let's close in prayer. Abba, Father, we bless you and thank you for this Sabbath day. For without this day, Yahweh, and what it means, we would not be here. Who knows what would have happened to any of us, Abba, out in the world if you did not call us. It would, certainly would be a completely different life. And so, Yahweh, the present sufferings of this age are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's about to be revealed. So what inconveniences we may be going through now, what sacrifices we may be making now, Yahweh, is nothing compared to the position that we will have within the kingdom and the blessings and the glorification that you will bestow upon your people, the sons of Elohim, who you bring to glory, Abba, in the kingdom. And so we just want to thank you, Yahweh. We just pray that we, you will help us to be mindful stewards, to really, really, really want to seek that shalom peace that your Sabbath truly possesses, that we, and when we enter into those gates, that there's no way you're going to allow any of the enemy to come in and corrupt our time with you on the Holy Sabbath, Abba. We just bless you and we thank you, Yahweh, for this Sabbath day and all that it means. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen.